Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. Adam sent me this best practices document earlier this week and said, hey, Andy, take a look at this. I think it would make a great show. And so we're going to go through one of the best practices that Microsoft has actually published. And it's something that I have not read before until Adam sent it to me this week. And I thought it was really, really well thought out and a lot of good information in this particular best practice. So we're going to talk about securing privileged access today. And we're going to dive into what Microsoft kind of recommends for organizations on how to secure their privileged access. And so organizations should really try to make this a priority because privileged access is something that a lot of attackers will go for. And if they get those credentials, they can cause a lot of damage. When we talk through some of these concepts, we'll have separate out like the different security levels and we'll get a little bit more into it. But at the very, very highest level, if those credentials get compromised at the highest security level, those are the ones that are going to cause the most negative impact to an organization. So as far as strategy goes, we're going to talk through about how Microsoft recommends adopting this privileged access strategy so that you can lower your risk if something happens, if you get attacked, and if those credentials get compromised, you can try to soften the blow, so to speak. The whole concept is built on zero trust principles with explicit validation, least privilege access, and assumption of breach. And it's really important that when we talk through the strategy that there really is no silver bullet as far as a technical solution. A lot of people are always looking for a specific solution to implement or buy that will magically make all of their security worries go away. And there really isn't. You're going to try to mitigate as much risk as possible, but you have to kind of blend a lot of best practices together to try to Make a holistic solution on what you have at your company so that you can protect against multiple different attack entry points. And the word holistic, I think you'll hear throughout this discussion in that you have to look at it from all angles because you're only as good as your weakest link. And an attacker in charge of your privileged accounts can undermine or undo all of your other security assurances is is one of the things the documentation calls out here. And that's a really important concept to understand that this is kind of that foundation. If you don't have this right, you can do all the other work you want, but if somebody has privileged access, they can just work around those controls. So this is why it's so important and so foundational to everything we talk about. So two goals that we want to lay out when we talk about securing privileged access. We want to strictly limit the ability to perform privileged actions to only a few authorized pathways or users. And then we want to protect and closely monitor those pathways. And as you read through the documentation on these best practices, one of the things that struck me as really, really important was the strategic assumption as you read through this is that cloud is the source of security. And this may be something that may be a pain point for some organizations because if you're still on-prem or you're trying to do a hybrid situation and you're syncing identities to the cloud from on-prem, that's not the strategic overview of how Microsoft is recommending that you implement this type of privileged access. So when we talk about the cloud, there's a lot of 
benefits to having the cloud be your source of security. It has better capabilities. The software management and security is pretty powerful these days. And there's a lot of native integration, a lot of security intelligence. It's also easier and faster. So if you're adopting cloud services, there usually is not a lot of infrastructure that you have to deploy on-prem. And it requires less maintenance. The cloud is managed and maintained by vendor organizations rather than your internal IT and having to have maintenance time and downtime and patching and all of that. And then, of course, the scaling and improving of the cloud is always going to be much better than what you can do internally. So that is the reason why the whole strategic assumption is to have the cloud and there was even more guidance on whether or not you should sync different identities to the cloud, including privileged access. In light of the SolarGate attacks, Alex Weiner, who is one of our PMs for identity, he published a blog post on securing your your M365 environment against on-premise attacks. And there were a couple key concepts. You want to go through those, Adam? Yeah. And but before I do real quick, ju- just to kind of touch on what you had just gone over with the strategic assumption of this whole kind of treatise on privileged um, access is that it's important to have a point of view when you're writing something like this and to share that point of view openly and say, here's the assumptions we're working from as we write this. And so, you know, different security vendors might publish something like this and they might have a different perspective. This is one of them. And it it is based in some of those cloud assumptions around the, the amount of signal and telemetry baked into the cloud that informs some of its security tooling. The fact that it is, easier and faster. It's more scalable, you know, spin up, spin down services. The fact that there's no maintenance that you have to do or less maintenance. And then the fact that there's automatic improvements baked in over time with very little effort on your part. There's just a lot of benefits there. And and so that informs kind of the whole discussion as, as it's gone through um, in, in this conversation. So that's, I'm, I'm really glad you went over that Andy, because it's really important to kind of understand the, the perspective here. And then, kind of staying on that same topic. Now we talked about the two simple goals of securing privileged access. And one of them was to limit the ability to perform privileged actions to a few authorized pathways, and then to protect and closely monitor those pathways. And so this guidance from Alex Weiner that you had mentioned here aligns with those two goals in that we want to close or or limit or restrict as many of the pathways to move from on-premises compromise to compromise the cloud, make that harder to do, and then give more protection and, and monitoring to those pathways by closing most of them off so we have less places to look. And so the guidance from Alex Weinert here, and again, this was published in uh, the the aftermath of the SolarGate scenario. And by the way, we should mention one of the drivers behind that was when the attackers behind SolarGate gained access to on-premises infrastructure, they often stole secrets, uh, things used like signing keys to be able to sign certificates or sign tokens or create tokens that were literally signed in a way that they would be trusted by other services. They weren't like forged, they're legit. They actually are signed with that same key. And so everything else would would trust them. And so an example is if you had a federated identity provider of some kind and you had attackers inside your on-premises network and they stole the secrets used to create or sign the tokens from that federated identity provider, then those can be passed to a cloud service, in this case, Microsoft 365 or Azure Active Directory, and say, I'm the global admin. And again, there's no comp, there's no um, vulnerability being worked here. 
It's not doing anything that, that represents like a failure of the code. The code is validating Hey, this token was signed. It matches the private key that I have. So everything is legit and I'm going to let this person in and I'm going to grant them global admin privilege. So anyhow, all that's to say, here's some of the guidance to help prevent against that escalation path. And number one is all administrative accounts in Microsoft 365 should be mastered in Azure AD. In other words, they should be cloud only identities. That means there is no on-premises identity that is synchronized to Azure AD for privileged accounts. That means there's nothing sitting with a federated identity provider that I can potentially use as an escalation path. It's only in Azure AD, and that's the only way to authenticate to it. And by the way, when I authenticate, I should be prompted, of course, to do multi-factor authentication, kind of obvious, but also... I should be secured in some way by Azure AD conditional access. That should be looking for additional assurances above and beyond. I had a valid username. I had a valid password and I did an MFA challenge successfully. There should be other assurances as well. Maybe I'm only coming from a certain IP range, or maybe I'm coming from, in this case, a managed device. So now we have a device that's managed in the cloud and the cloud only by Microsoft Endpoint Manager. And we're validating that that device is indeed managed, it's healthy, and it's not under current threat before we allow it to get in. So now we've gone from two factors to three or potentially four factors before that privileged account can gain access to a thing. And that is gonna significantly strengthen and secure those cloud privileged identities and ensure that even if I haven't uh, compromised on premises, there isn't an easy escalation path to the cloud. Those are two separate things. So a concept that's going to come up as we go through this conversation is we want to worsen the return on investment for attackers. We want to make it that it takes more work to accomplish less. And this is a perfect example of that. If I can't seamlessly break into on-premises and move to the cloud, well, now my ROI just got worse because now I have to invest all the effort to get there. Some of the other guidance from Mr. Weinert as well was that devices should be managed strictly in the cloud with Microsoft Endpoint Manager, like I mentioned, and also use cloud authentication to eliminate dependencies on on-premises credentials. So I mentioned they should be cloud only identities, but even for all your identities, move to a managed authentication method like password hash synchronization. And then from there, you don't have any on premises dependencies for that authentication flow, even for your non privileged users. So now you've, you've not only eliminated that that escalation path for privileged accounts, but you've even made it that just because I compromised an on prem um, environment doesn't mean I can even take that to move to a non-privileged user in the cloud because that authentication flow is totally separate as well. So some good guidance there. We will of course link to it in the show notes. And I think we've linked to it a couple of times before, but the reason why we keep bringing it up is I, I know Andy in my day job and your day job too, we talk to a lot of customers that aren't doing a lot of this yet. So we're trying to spread the gospel here that these are some quick wins you can get that if you ever do have a really bad day, you're, you're going to have a bad day and not a worse day. This was one of the biggest key concepts that I took away at my previous job. And I know a lot of organizations, they maybe start with one identity and that identity is your everyday identity that is accessing your email and your web browsing and signing into your machine. And then they grant those identities administrative privileges. Maybe you've moved to separate those identities to an administrative account and a regular user account. But a lot of times you'll sync your domain admin to Azure AD and that same identity will be a global admin. It's very common practice to do that. And what Mr. Weinhardt is saying and what really you should move to is trying to separate those identities. And it can be difficult. It can be somewhat jarring depending on how people are signing in because maybe 
an IT admin will have a regular user account, an on-prem admin account, and then now they have a cloud admin account. So that's three different logins they got to keep track of. So that can be a little bit jarring, and it can be a not that great of an experience, but it is important for security to keep these separated. So the, the next part of the documentation here got into talking about success criteria. And, and by the way, as we're having this conversation, of course, it would be really boring for us to just do a podcast that reads the documentation. If you want somebody to like give you an audio book of it, I think there are people that would do a better job than Andy and I on that. So what we're trying to do is just kind of summarize and pick out some highlights and have some discussion around them. So on this page on success criteria, the reason I sent this to Andy in the first place is because I feel like there are some eyebrow raising parts of this, this documentation in terms of things like the no silver bullet thing that Andy talked about at the top of the show. That is really kind of targeted at people who think, Hey, I bought a pim pam solution from, you know, vendor X and now we have solved privilege access. We have, we've completed the task. Good job guys. You know, mission accomplished. And I, th I think that first bullet really emphasizing that there is no silver bullet is really important. This is another one that I thought was really interesting as well, where I'm going to almost read this verbatim just because I thought it was, it was so kind of powerful. And so I'm quoting here. Ruthless prioritization is the practice of taking the most effective actions with the fastest time to value first, even if those efforts don't fit pre-existing plans, perceptions, or habits. While it's always tempting for security professionals to try to optimize familiar existing controls like network security and firewalls for newer attacks, this path consistently leads to failure. And so that's end quote. That comes from the Microsoft response team talking about they've seen time and time again that customers and security professionals, since especially a lot of them kind of grew out of network security because that's where a lot of InfoSec started, they tend to want to stick to what they're familiar with and continue to invest there and harden there. And what we have to do when we're trying to build this, this um, privileged access kind of modernization is to be do you ruthless prioritization on what is going to deliver the most value, the fastest, where can we get our quickest wins first? That's the least amount of effort for the most amount of security improvement. And that's where we have to look in the mirror really, really hard and say, I'm familiar with this. I'm comfortable with this, but I'm going to have to learn new skills and new techniques and think about things differently from the attacker's perspective in order to really be effective and accomplish a lot here. And so I said this before, but I'll say this again, your goal should be to increase the attacker's cost while minimizing your own security investment level. So there's a nice little graphic on there that has two, two, um, two sides of it. And one of them is attacker's cost. And one of them is security investment. And the goal is that you invest as little as possible to most dramatically ratchet up the attacker's cost there. And that's where this ruthless prioritization comes in of determining what ways let you accomplish that goal. And then finally, something we always need to think about, and, and we kind of mentioned like weakest link and all that, the clean source principle, which states that all security dependencies must be as trustworthy as the object being secured. So you have to start with a clean source before you can build further on top of it in terms of um, privileged access. So if, for example, as we get into say privileged workstations, the, the theory here is that you start with a workstation that is hardened and privileged, and then you can go less privilege on top of that. So as an example at Microsoft, if you have like a secure access workstation, that workstation itself is totally hardened. It doesn't run anything, but what is required to do that secure administration. And then if you need something to do like day-to-day -day productivity task, that runs in a virtual machine, but not the other way around. You can't build security back in when it's already kind of been lost. 
So if you have your base machine, you're like, oh, I'm going to run my, my, you know, my privileged workstation in a VM. It doesn't work that way because the host operating system is potentially compromised and then you can flow downstream from there. So that's a, an important concept and part of our success criteria as we think through what does a successful implementation looks like? It looks like we start from where we know we have a clean source and we build outward from there moving forward. And building off of that, the strategy that Microsoft really recommends is building a closed loop system. So like what Adam said here, you want to have trustworthy, clean devices, clean accounts, clean intermediate intermediary systems that can be used for privilege access. So all of that stays kind of in a closed loop. Now you can have user accounts and user access and there are ways that you can authorize like certain elevation paths, like just in time access, Azure privilege identity management is one of those ways. Another one you may be familiar with is Azure bastion, where you can have just in time access to RDP or SSH into a VM. And so those are great ways to kind of limit the standing access, but still allow users to escalate an account to a privileged state. And then you have privileged access where, again, you have separate accounts. It's always recommended to have separate accounts with stricter conditional access around them, stricter um, intermediary systems that have to gain access to the corporate data. So as we talk through this strategy, Microsoft has different security levels. And I thought this was really neat and kind of a great way to summarize how to think about your privileged access. So they have three different levels. The first level is enterprise security. And that's where it's your basic users. It's all enterprise users, productivity scenarios. And those are the ones that serve as a starting point and you build progressively on top of that. So those are your normal users and your base level enterprise security controls that you would want to implement. Then you have specialized security. Specialized security are roles that have an elevated business impact. And you should have some sort of documented criteria for specialized accounts and privileged accounts. So maybe, for example, a potential business impact of over $1 million if this account were to be compromised. And then identify all the roles and accounts that meet their criteria and then categorize those accounts as specialized accounts. Now, when I was going through the documentation, they gave you some examples, and I thought these were great. Developers of business-sensitive uh, systems, executives, and especially their personal assistants. I think we've talked about you know, the admins of those executives basically being more powerful than the executives. Sometimes they know everything about their execs, uh, sensitive it admins, high impact social media accounts. That's something that a lot of companies have to deal with these days. How do you secure the credentials for those social media accounts? And a lot of times they don't have a way to have multiple users it's not like a business account like a twitter account you have one login so how do you secure all of those and so those are accounts that you would then classify as specialized security and then your Andy, highest level before you move on also i i like the call out here of sensitive business roles which people i think don't always consider when they're when they're building a practice like this they they laid out people like people who use Swift terminals or researchers who have access to sensitive data, people who have access to the financial reports before they're publicly released, um, people who run payroll, people who run approval for sensitive business processes. So that's the other thing is we always think of in terms of like, because we're in tech, we think IT, we think technologists, but there's plenty of people who have very privileged access in the business and those are sensitive roles too. They might not have 
broad impact across the entire org, but they have sensitive access to a specific part of the business. And that was to me, I, I mentioned a couple eyebrow raising parts. That was one of them right there. I'd never thought of that when I was thinking of building a privileged access practice. And so that was really, really good call out. And, and then I also appreciated the executive and admin assistant call out because we are trying so hard to get them to understand like, no, 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 you don't want less security. You want more security. You are more impactful than me. You know, well, maybe not me because I used to run the email system, but you get the point like the rank and file. Yeah. Thanks for the call out, Adam. Mm-hmm. Of course, the last one is the privileged security, which is the highest level. And those are the IT roles, right? Those are the domain admins, the global admins, the org admins, you know, for other business critical systems and, um, you know, server admins, account operators, which is like a built-in role in, in AD. You know, those are sensitive, critical roles that if they were to be compromised, like Adam said, they can essentially circumvent any other security controls that you have in place because they are the global admin or the domain admin. So any type of custom delegated groups, your help desk, your tier two, tier three, you know, those are all privileged access. Local admins as well. So that's something that a lot of people don't think about, but you know anyone who's a local admin on a workstation or local admin on servers you know those should be limited as much as possible users who can rdp into sensitive servers so as we talk through those three different ones you know they'll they'll play a different role in how you want to scope out your privileged access uh, program strategy mm-hmm Next, the documentation moved on to privileged access intermediaries, which Andy, I think you you mentioned previously as we've conversed. And what are in, intermediaries? Well, those are things like VPNs, jump servers, remote desktop, pim pam solutions. And so there's really two things you need to think about when you're evaluating the risk of an intermediary solution. Number one is going to be attacker opportunity. So that's the available attack surface. What can I get to from this solution? So if you look at things like mm, VPN, it's publicly exposed to the internet. So that's attractive. They usually only have a few ports open, but I only need a few ports. If I can get into that VPN, the the potential um, attacker value is tremendous because I gain full network connectivity. I might be able to observe account credentials flowing through that VPN solution. I might be able to impersonate device identities. All sorts of cool stuff come by hitting that. Jump server, that's a really interesting one because you think of that as, oh, well, that's a good practice, right? And what I, I guess I hadn't really considered there as well is so if you have like one or two jump servers that all your admins jump into to go to other things, you have loaded up that jump server with the hashes for all your administrative accounts. And if somebody can figure out how to steal those hashes and pass those hashes, oh baby, you know, they've got the keys to the kingdom right there. And uh Pim Pam solutions, those might be running in your local infrastructure. So if I gain access, just a initial foothold into your on-premises network, I have an underlying OS I can hit. I have an entire application interface that I can try to bang on and the attacker value. I mean, my goodness, what's more valuable than something that holds all your privileged credentials in one place, all the eggs in one basket. So you need to look at both of those kind of uh, angles there, the the attack surface, which is the attacker opportunity, and then the attacker value, what they can gain from it. And um, so then there's some security guidance that's provided on, so what can you do to help with some of these solutions? Well, for PimPam, kind of the first thing to really think about is oftentimes they're presented as a silver bullet to solve all of these problems. And if you've been listening to this podcast and you thought, Oh, well, you know, we have vendor X for our PAM solution. We're solid. You know, we've got this figured out. That's, that's where we kind of need to zoom out a little bit and look at the bigger picture because again, okay, you have this PIM PAM solution, but if I compromise your device, then while you are in that solution, I can potentially observe things. 
you're, if you're signed in with a privileged account, then I can use that again, hash stealing, all sorts of different things I can do if I compromise a device, even though you have a pim pam solution. However, um, for the most part, you should just follow the guidance from the vendor on ways to harden that as much as possible. Another call out was for certain business critical workflows, you should consider having two pr um, approvers because that will reduce your risk in case of a insider kind of attack where Andy and I got together to, you know, plot against the company. Um, and that way we would need another approver to be able to break through that workflow. So that's something to consider as well. Uh, with VPN, you should connect those to a cloud identity provider through SAML. Obviously, I'd love you to use Azure AD, but it would be just as good to connect it to a ping or an Okta and using the stronger identity controls in those solutions as the front gate for your VPN. So your VPN is just ingesting and accepting SAML tokens as opposed to performing that authentication task itself. Again, you need to patch your VPNs and you need to have business sign off that you can do that, that you can take it down, that there is a patching window, that you're allowed to do maintenance. Having a standard that the VPN can never go down is probably not a good long-term strategy if you can't patch it. Because again, public facing, it's a, in, in a very attractive target because once I get in your VPN, I have unfettered access to your network. Uh, again, follow your vendor guidance as much as possible. And then consider reducing your dependency on VPN as much as you can. So I think we've talked about some of these solutions on, on different shows, but things like Azure app proxy, or there's other solutions that do that too, like F5 APM, where you get, uh, do access to those like internally hosted web apps through some sort of proxy interface. And you do access to them individually, as opposed to I'm on the VPN and now I have access to all the things. So reduce your dependency on it is helpful as well. And finally, with a remote desktop or a jump server, uh, don't expose it directly to the internet. RDP is not really designed to be public facing. It is susceptible to things like password spray. So you're better off doing some sort of proxy or gateway for your RDP environment. And consider again, like a tool like Azure App Proxy to put in front of it. And that can help harden your RDP environment as well. So something to think about with your intermediaries, because again, you're only as good as your weakest link. And some of those tools, while they can help in many key ways, they also introduce their own risks and their own potential vulnerabilities. So be aware of them and do what you can to mitigate them. I guess another one we forgot to mention, Andy, but would be valuable as well would be to do things like um, Credential Guard uh, would, would also help harden that sort of thing. So. so the documentation spends a lot of time on securing the devices, which in my new role at Microsoft, I love talking about. And this is really interesting because I've never used a PAW or a secure access workstation before. And reading through the documentation, it gets very, very granular on what Microsoft recommends for a secure access workstation. Now we talked through those different security levels, the enterprise, the specialized, and privileged. And they have recommendations on specific policies that you should be deploying for those different levels of privileged access. Now, if we go back and think about it, that specialized security level, you know, I'm just going to pull that one out because we talked about those developers, I, um, executive admins, finance folks, payroll administrators, you know, Think about those as getting a second specialized or, you know, as their primary specialized workstation because their work is important and can be impactful if compromised to the organization. So there's a table that kind of summarizes all the different things. And, you know, at the beginning, we talked about how all of the devices should be managed by some sort of cloud solution like Microsoft Endpoint Manager. What I found was interesting, and this was already eyebrow raising for me, was if, let's say, Adam is a finance payroll administrator and I'm just a normal call center guy, well, 
in the documentation that Microsoft recommends, one of the policies is denying BYOD device enrollment. And so for me, as normal Joe Blow at the call center, if I want to enroll my own device using my identity to have Intune and email and all that, that's fine. But then for Adam, because he's privileged, we'd actually deny BYOD enrollment. And so what that means is the devices that he has to use for his job would be issued, you know, using some sort of automated device enrollment like autopilot or Apple business manager or Android enterprise, something like that. So that was really, really interesting to me to deny BYOD device enrollment for those specialized and privileged accounts. Security baselines, you know, that's something that is in Microsoft Endpoint Manager, which is a great starting point for a lot of organizations. They have all of the security best practices and policies that Microsoft at least kind of carves out. If you're not sure where to start, you can use those baselines. Joining a personal device via autopilot, you know, for privileged accounts, it actually says don't do that. For enterprise and specialized accounts, Go ahead and do that, but for the privileged, the high-level privileged accounts, no personal devices allowed for those identities. And then another really interesting one was the URL restriction. And I remember talking to Morgan when we had him on way, way back for our AD security show, and he talked about PAWS and how on his PAW he would restrict all the Internet access to specific URLs only. And that's called out here as well as part of the securing devices where for enterprise users, you know, you're going to allow them to go pretty much everywhere. And we've talked about on the show kind of having a more liberal policy on where we allow our users to go to for websites, except for, you know, the, the really bad stuff. The same thing for the specialized roles. But then for the privileged roles, Microsoft says that you should deny by default, actually. So internet traffic is denied, and then you allow explicitly the sites that you need to go to for part of your job. So admin.microsoft.com or portal.azure.com, those would be URLs that you would explicitly add to the allow list, and then by default, you're actually denying internet traffic. Admin rights removal. Well, that's something we've talked about at length on this show before. And for privileged access workstations, we recommend that you remove local admin. We recommend that you remove local admin for those specialized roles. And so, you know, there's a whole list of these different policies, and it's very granular. And they walk through the entire implementation of how to do this. And so... You know, we're going to give you a link to this this whole uh, best practice document, but one of them, part of this, is the privileged access implementation. And in that part of this documentation, they walk through exactly from the creation of different security groups, the AAD configuration, users that you should be adding to AAD, the div- dynamic device groups, the entire dynamic device query that you're going to be using, device configuration, configuration profiles within Intune and MEM, specific Azure Active Directory conditional access rules, firewall settings, MCAS restrictions to approved URLs. So, I mean, it walks through everything, even down to an example, Custo query for advanced hunting for security events within Microsoft Defender for Endpoint. So highly recommend that you take a look at this, even if it's for fun and you just want to spin up a a device and write these rules just for one user, like an example user, I would recommend walking through this entire implementation and trying it out for securing a device and seeing how that goes. Kind of similar to our show with Shannon, when we talked about Azure AD joining devices, like just give it a try and then see what you can and cannot do. Like that would be my way of approaching this is walking through this entire implementation, 
implementing a secure access workstation and then using it and seeing what the pain points are because there's always going to be some sort of balance between productivity and usability. So one of the things that I thought was interesting with the uh, going, going back a little bit to the privileged access devices too, was in a lot of ways, all this documentation kind of feels like the secret recipe, like the secret sauce. This is best that I can tell. And again, I'm just a rank and file guy at Microsoft. I'm not involved with securing Microsoft, the organization, but best that I can tell this aligns pretty closely to how we run our business. So people are always asking like, well, how's Microsoft do it? This is literally kind of the point by point guidance on a lot of how we, we run our business. So I think that's, that's really just an interesting call out in general, like at Microsoft rank and file users do have admin rights on their machine. I do. Andy does. And one of the call outs here, remember Andy's laid out like those three different levels of privilege. We're talking about enterprise specialized privileged enterprise users, which are your rank and file doesn't say you have to remove admin rights for them. No, I mean, in general, that's not a bad idea if you can do that, but it's not a specific call it on here. That's a have to do. And that's just interesting because that's actually how Microsoft runs their business. So I thought that was interesting too, just in that if you want kind of the, the inside scoop, the, I think this aligns pretty closely to it. I'm sure it's not everything and it's not exactly, you know, our internal doc, but it, I think it's darn close in a lot of ways. Also, I mean, this, this walkthrough is really, really detailed and I agree, Andy, I think this is something I want to go do in my test environment just to kind of understand a lot of the thought process and the mindset behind this, because it's, it's really easy to follow. And, um, I think I'll learn a lot from doing it too. And and I've done a lot of this before, but just kind of seeing like how, how the guidance plays out in practice, as far as getting down to, like you said, dynamic device groups, and you've seen the query we're used to pull those devices in, and then the policies we're applying against that device group. That's all interesting stuff to kind of see how the guidance is to do all that. So there's, there's a ton here. Um, with the complete walkthrough. There's also a modernization plan, which I thought was very, very good. Again, it walks through several different things and we can dive into each one of these maybe deeper at, at a later show, but I wanted to give you some high level examples of modernization when it comes to separating and managing privileged accounts. And so one of the things is you should have an emergency access account. These are usually accounts that are not included in conditional access policies. They're usually accounts that are not MFA enabled. And you would have a super long, very complicated password that you would store offline somewhere. And it's like a break glass situation. And so it's always good to have one of those in case like MFA goes down, which has happened, um, or your identity provider conks out or something like that. So you having that break class account is a good thing to have just in case. We talked about Azure Active Directory privilege identity management. This is that just in time escalation. I implemented this at my previous company. It was really, really nice to have. So no one in the company had standing global admin privileges. If you needed global admin, you had to escalate to it. And it's just a nice peace of mind that, you know, you can make it as loose as you want. In fact, at the previous company, we allowed you to escalate it for eight hours without having an approval process. You could put an approval process, you know, Adam talked about having two people approve for it to kind of prevent against abuse. You know, we, we had it for eight hours during the work week. And, you know, that was nice because at the end of the day, you're probably not using your global admin account and you know that that privilege gets taken away automatically. And so no one has it anymore. Even if you implement it in a very light use case there, it's just a nice peace of mind to know that at the end of the day on the weekend, no one has global admin. You also want to identify and categorize, you know, like, like we talked about in those different security levels, your privileged accounts. Separating out your accounts, we talked about that from your on-prem 
AD and having the, that separation between privileged accounts. So not, not necessarily like all of your accounts, although that'd be nice to get to that point, but for privileged accounts, for sure, you want to separate that out. And then, you know, having some sort of monitoring. Microsoft has a tool called Microsoft Defender for Identity, which used to be known as Azure ATP, but having those signals and those alerts come up when someone's added to a privileged group. If someone gets added to domain admin group or someone gets added to the enterprise admin group or you have clear text LDAP authentications going on in your AD environment, you know, those things are things that you want to get alerted on. And so closely monitoring if those accounts are changed if they're logged on at different times and used for activities that, you know, if someone's running PS exec on your domain controller, that's something that you'd want to know about. And so some alerting tool like defender for identity would be great to have. We also talk about improving credential management. And this is something that I'm not sure we've talked about too much, but, Implementing and documenting self-service password reset, that's great for users. It takes a lot of work time away from your help desk. You know, There's a lot of time spent at a lot of companies at the help desk just resetting passwords. So having self-service password reset and combining that with self-registering security information, like having to be able to reset your MFA or reset like a security token. You want to enable MFA through conditional access. And if you can, if you're using Azure AD, passwordless authentication, you know, having to not enter in your password and having SSO is really, really good for all of your accounts, especially for your privileged accounts. Legacy authentication is another one. You can block that through conditional access. It's, Sometimes at companies, I've found that there are applications that people are use, still using those legacy authentication pro, uh, protocols. But for your privileged accounts, for sure, and this was something that I didn't think about when I was configuring my conditional access policies at my previous organization, that's something that you could do for sure because your privileged accounts shouldn't be using legacy auth to... to you know, at all. And so that's an easy, you know, carve out policy specific targeted at privileged accounts to say, let's block legacy authentication for that. So that, that would be something that I would take away and definitely do. And then application consent process, all of those OAuths, you know, Microsoft recommends to take that away from your users. You want to have some sort of approval process. Again, there's that middle ground now in Azure AD where you can allow published uh, apps from trusted publishers to be automatically um, approved or you can have an approval process or even grant custom policies to say this specific policy like this app can read a user's calendar all users calendars or something like that. That's a little bit on the low risk side. You can actually categorize that yourself as low risk. And if those permissions come up for an app, a user can automatically approve that themselves, but shouldn't just grant blanket access to OAuth Azure active directory or any IDP app for authentication. You know, one of the, uh, you mentioned break glass accounts, and, and one of the things I, I saw people do that I think is really clever is I've seen people do those with a FIDO, a FIDO2 key. So now you, ha instead of having like mm. your super long password printed out and stored somewhere, you actually have a physical hardware token instead that's you literally going to break the glass to go get and, and use that for your break glass account. I thought that was interesting because that makes it, you know, completely unbreakable unless you have physical access to the hardware token. So that's another clever way to do that. Um, everything else you said, what, what kind of stood out to me is think of your wish list of things you wish you could do 
for your enterprise accounts, you know, that rank and file and do all those things for your privileged accounts. So I wish we could turn off legacy auth. You can for your privileged accounts. I wish we could get to a device-based conditional access model. You should for your privileged accounts, stuff like that, where there might be a, a someday kind of dream to turn on. Like this is where you turn it all on now because it, the, the amount of security it adds is just tremendous. If somebody can't sign in with a privileged account, unless they have your managed device, their username, their password, and their second factor, that's a lot of stuff that you have to all produce. And oh, by the way, we're going to look at the risk of the sign-in as well. And if anything's anomalous, we're not going to allow the sign-in to proceed. So if they're signing in from an unfamiliar country or location, then we're going to you know, not allow that either. That's a lot of signal being looked at and determined before we allow a privileged uh, sign-in to proceed. And I think that's really, really powerful. So use all of the controls you can on those um, on those accounts in particular, and then use as many of them as you can on specialized accounts as well. You know, you kind of think of moving down the chain uh, in how many controls you can implement there. And if you made it this far in the show, the final thing that I wanted to touch on was there's a section in this documentation that talks about privileged access administration. And I found this to be really, really helpful and kind of hit home for me because as I read through this, I was like, yep, I've been in an organization that does poorly at this. Yep. I've been in an organization who does poorly at this. So they talk about minimizing the number of critical impact admins. This is super important. In fact, in Azure AD, it yells at you if you have more than five global admins. So don't have more than five global admins for sure. It depends on how big your organization is. But again, you have those just in time. If you're using some sort of just in time, Azure AD only yells at you if you have five global admins at the same time. And in reality, you probably don't need five global admins at the same time doing the work. They probably can accomplish that with other roles. And speaking of roles, it talks about using the built-in roles. You know, Microsoft has a bunch of built-in roles already, and I'm sure at other IDPs or other you know, solutions, they have built-in roles. You know, use those built-in roles because they're generally pretty good. When you start getting custom or granular policies, that starts to get a little bit more complicated, and complexity is the enemy of security in general. Lifecycle management. How do you manage your privileged accounts? I think a lot of organizations are really, really good at disabling the standard user account when that user leaves. But what happens if they have a privileged account? Is that part of your lifecycle management? Are you making sure that that admin is getting disabled? And if you're following this kind of guidance, again, it does kind of make it a little bit more difficult because if you disable the AD account, you know, you still have to go into the cloud and disable the admin accounts there. And that's even more important because those cloud accounts can be accessed from anywhere, right? You don't have to be on VPN in order to get to them. And it, But if you're following the guidance with the secure devices, then those signals, again, if you have a managed device and all of this other stuff, those are signals that can prevent you know, someone who has been terminated from gaining access still. And then the final thing is attack simulation for critical impact accounts. I thought this was really interesting. You know, when you're going through your different red team or blue team exercises or your pen test, you know, simulate what happens if a critical account gets compromised. What are your steps? Have a playbook for that and think about what would happen and how you would react to if one of those accounts get compromised and to try to recover from that. This was a lot, dear listener, and thanks for sticking with us here. But the reason we, we brought this up is I had stumbled upon this new kind of section of the Microsoft Docs page with all of these best practices. And in my day job, it's something people ask for frequently, like, well, what's Microsoft recommend? What do you, what do you recommend to do? 
And again, it's not the end all be all. There's going to be different perspectives and different opinions on how to accomplish this. It's one opinion. And as we mentioned at the top of the show, it's written through the lens of the cloud is a security enabler. And that aligns throughout all of what is written. But I think you can take a lot away from this. And I think if you're not kind of taking a, a step back a couple of times as you look through this or raising at least a couple of eyebrows, then I don't know if you're reading it that thoroughly because I don't know if there's anybody who, who can look through this documentation and not find at least a thing or two that's going to make them say, man, I didn't thought of it that way or I hadn't looked at it that way. So that's why we, we brought it up and just how foundational and important it is to protect against things like human operated ransomware, which is all the rage these days. This is one of the most powerful things you can do to protect your organization against being the next victim. Because if those attackers get in and the ROI is poor, they're going to go somewhere else where they can make money. And you do that by making it really, really hard for them to get the keys to the kingdom and start to do all the things. So there's a lot here. There's a lot to think about. And that's just because there isn't that silver bullet. There isn't the one answer where if you just go do this, you've solved the problem. There's a lot of different steps and vectors and things you need to consider as you go through this. So call back to one of the first concepts I brought up, ruthless prioritization. As you read through this, as you listen to the show, think of the gaps that are largest in your org and that, that you can remediate the quickest and go do them. Even if it's an area of discomfort for you or something that you're not familiar with, maybe you've never really done much with device management, but you've recognized that there's a real opportunity here to link device identity with personal identity and use that as part of a sign-in process to choose whether or not to allow a sign-in to proceed. That's a huge win you can get and eliminates a whole bunch of attack vectors. And that's just one of many. So uh, thanks for sticking with us. Andy, any final thoughts before we wrap up? There's a lot here. And so my final thought is just take it one step at a time. Mm -hmm. you know, like Adam said, prioritize. You don't have to go and deploy a secure device for all of your admins tomorrow. Maybe it's just implementing some conditional access or MFA or just separating out your accounts. Maybe you have one user account and that's doing your regular stuff plus your admin stuff. Or maybe it's separating out your domain admins from your global admins. You know, one thing at a time, you don't have to improve all of your security overnight. You know, it's a journey. So you don't have to eat the entire elephant in, in one sitting, essentially. Mm-hmm. So thanks for sticking with us. This was a pretty detailed show. That's our show for this week. All of the documentation will include in the show notes as well as our contact information. If you have security topics you want us to talk about or comments on the show, please reach out to us. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.